I want to welcome you to the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology's YouTube channel and our anesthesiology keyword review. Today we're talking about psychiatric issues and psychiatric drugs and anesthesia. As we look back over the last decade or so on keywords from the American Board of Anesthesia that are published the year after an in-training exam, they are shown here. You can see that the keywords focus on electroconvulsive therapy, its contraindications, its physiologic effects, how long a seizure occurs and what we do that can affect that seizure duration, and things like some drugs used in psychiatry, SSRIs, lithium, and a complication of uh, psychiatric drugs, specifically serotonin syndrome. Let's go right into our first keyword, which is electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. The patient at the right is set up for an electroconvulsive therapy and has stimulating electrodes on their head. The EKG is recorded, an intravenous line is in place, a pulse oximeter is used, a blood pressure cuff is on the arm, and oftentimes some form of blood pressure cuff or tourniquet is placed on one of the extremities to uh, be able to limit the movement of the neuromuscular blocking agent, usually succinylcholine, into that muscle such that it is not paralyzed. And when the seizure is induced and preferably crosses over the corpus callosum to the opposite side, for example, if the seizure was induced on the left, it crosses over to the right. The right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. So your left lower extremity contracts, your foot contracts because the succinylcholine is not blocking the muscles there. And so that's the reason for this setup. And in electroconvulsive therapy, we provide general anesthesia, oftentimes with uh, methohexatol or uh, propofol, although propofol is associated with a reduction in the seizure duration and a neuromuscular blocker to avoid some of the injury that could occur from the massive contraction of muscles that can occur during a generalized seizure. We desire a seizure of approximately 30 to 50 seconds. It is the length of the seizure and the amount of seizures that they have uh, that is associated with the beneficial effects of electroconvulsive therapy. And therefore, we often see patients daily for an extended period of time having ECTs of these short seizure duration. Some contraindications to ECT includes angina, DVT, you can imagine if the leg muscles squeezed and there was a uh, blood clot in the legs or somewhere else it could squeeze and push it towards the heart. High risk pregnancy, although pregnancy in and of itself is not an absolute contraindication. If you had a pregnant lady that was vegetatively depressed and at risk for taking her own life, there may be an indication for ECT in that patient. Severe osteoporosis, relative contraindication, because if the muscles contract, you could snap brittle bones and retinal detachment is another. Most pacemakers are okay to utilize with ECT therapy. Now, many textbooks will state absolute contraindications, including things like recent MI, recent cerebral vascular accident, intracranial mass, increased intracranial pressure, and pheochromocytoma. However, you must weigh the risk in a patient with vegetative depression and risk for suicide against some of these, for example, if they had a recent MI. However, Increased intracranial pressure, you can imagine if you seize and the uh, cerebral metabolism goes up in your head, cerebral blood flow goes up in your head, it's gonna raise intracranial pressure and they could potentially herniate. So a psychiatrist would evaluate the patient and help determine the, whether it is an absolute contraindication and weigh uh, something that is existing in your patient such as coronary artery disease and recent MI against the risk of uh, untreated psychiatric disease. The physiologic response to ECT is the next key word. And initially, there is massive parasympathetic discharge, almost immediately followed by sympathetic discharge. So the parasympathetics kick in first and you can get bradycardia and blood pressure can decrease, but very quickly the sympathetics kick in. Glycopyrrolate can be used if someone has problems with uh, severe bradycardia and hypotension. The sympathetic stimulation is what we normally see very quickly after the slowing of the heart rate with hypertension, tachycardia, increased myocardial oxygen requirements from the increased catecholamines and sympathetic stimulation. Heart rate goes up, contractility goes up, vascular resistance goes up, all things that are bad for myocardial oxygen requirements or 
require more oxygen by that heart. Dysrhythmias because of the catecholamines, and we can block sympathetic stimulation uh, by giving drugs like Esmol to block its end effects, like on the heart and its heart rate, nitroglycerin to veno and vasodilate to blunt the hypertensive effects, and we can use remifentanil to reduce the sympathetic discharge. The central nervous system during ECT uh, results in an increased cerebral metabolic rate. If you have a seizure going on in your brain, those cells are using a lot of oxygen, so cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen goes up dramatically. And because there's autoregulation of metabolism and flow, as metabolism goes up dramatically, blood flow goes up dramatically, the head can get more cerebral blood volume and intracranial pressure can go up. So avoiding electroconvulsive therapy in those with increased intracranial pressure is recommended. Intraocular pressure can go up in someone with glaucoma. This may be a problem. And intragastric pressure can go up uh, as well. The anesthesia drug selection for ECT is the next key word. And the classic pharmacologic management in the past has been maybe put giving them glycopyrrolate before you start to decrease that parasympathetic stimulation at the beginning in severe bradycardia. Some patients this may be indicated. Methylhexitol in the past was the gold standard. Uh, because it didn't block seizure duration and provided a very short period of general anesthesia. Propofol is known to shorten seizure duration, but still is often used by many in low doses. Lidocaine will block seizure duration and it should be avoided. So if you give propofol, it should not be combined with lidocaine. And then neuromuscular blockade is usually accomplished, assuming there's no contraindication of succinylcholine with it, at a low dose of about 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, and esmolol may be used to block the sympathetic discharge that occurs after the parasympathetic discharge. And then as the patient is induced and relaxed, uh, the seizure is uh, uh, stimulated, and the patient is mass ventilated during the paralysis period. And this is usually a very short period of being asleep, a very short period of being relaxed. Now, if they were an at-risk patient for gastric uh, regurgitation and uh, uh, pulmonary aspiration of gastric contents, that would be a patient who you'd want to rapid sequence, put a tube in, and then let them um, induce the seizure. Now the seizure duration, it's desirable as previously mentioned to have about 30 to 50 seconds or so of seizure to have a therapeutic effect. You can increase the seizure duration by using drugs like Atomidate or giving a person caffeine before the uh, seizure is attempted to be induced. Methohexitol and ketamine and remifentanil and esmol, labetalol and dexmedetomidine have essentially no effect on seizure duration and can be part of your pharmacologic management for the ECT. Propofol shortens it, and as you can imagine, a benzodiazepine like midazolam, which is used to treat seizures, is going to decrease the seizure duration or make it very hard to induce a seizure, and in general should be avoided, as uh, lidocaine should also be avoided. Some other concepts related to uh, ECT management, if you hyperventilate the patient and give them some caffeine before the seizure, it will increase the seizure duration. If you give some opioids like remifentanil and then reduce your dose of propofol, for example, if you were using propofol to a lower dose, then you would indirectly increase the seizure duration because you were able to reduce the dose of propofol, which is known to shorten seizure duration. Remifentanil can also decrease the sympathetic response as well as decrease the dose of induction agent required. Lidocaine doesn't tend to block the sympathetic response to electroconvulsive therapy, can actually decrease the seizure duration. So if you're using propofol and normally would combine your propofol with lidocaine, it's recommended that you do not administer lidocaine. Next key word is psychiatric medications. And let's first look at the graphic on the far right to summarize how some psychiatric medications work. First, beginning with um, the presynaptic area, which is making neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters include dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. And those neurotransmitters are the uh, breakdown of them, that is, is inhibited by MAOI inhibitors. So if someone's on an MAOI inhibitor, you could expect that they would have more presynaptic dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. 
As the nerve signal comes down, the uh, vesicles release their contents into the synaptic cleft. They go over to the postsynaptic cleft, have their action, and they are diffused away and catechol methyltransferase, an enzyme, breaks down many of the catecholamines. The tricyclic antidepressants work to block the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. So if they are released and the tricyclic antidepressant is being in, in, taken by a patient, they are not going to take up serotonin and norepinephrine to break it down as fast. And this is one of the mechanisms of the antidepressant effect of tricyclic antidepressants, raising serotonin and norepinephrine levels. SSRIs work specifically to block the reuptake of serotonin and increase the amount of serotonin and treat uh, depressive symptoms in many patients. There are other drugs that variably uh, block reuptake of norepinephrine and or serotonin and there are uh, new drugs that block both serotonin and norepinephrine's reuptake. So it's inherent on us when we see someone with, on a psychiatric medication preoperatively to look that medication up and understand its mechanism of action. Let's focus on TCAs. First, things like uh, desipramine and nortripline, some of the old drugs like Elevil, tricyclic antidepressants, depressants were used in the past, less so now for depression and chronic pain, occasionally now and sometimes for sleep at night. Uh, those are usually continued preoperatively. They can cause an increase in MAC and an exaggerated response to indirect acting drugs like ephedrine and direct acting sympathetic stimulation. But we normally don't just stop those drugs if they're taking them. MAOIs like phenylzine and tranocypromine, patients that have drug resistant depression may be on two drugs, including an MAOI inhibitors, uh, inhibitor, and you should be well aware that that drug interferes with the breakdown of catecholamines presynaptically. Parkinson's disease patients can may, uh, oftentimes be taking these. Should you continue them preoperatively? Usually, and we don't stop them in people with bad depression. Um, the risk of stopping them may be worse than the risk of some of the outcomes from the depressive symptoms. They decrease, um, that is they increase uh, MAC maybe, and uh, we should avoid drugs that may increase the amount of catecholamines, for example, that are released. For example, if you give ephedrine to a patient who's on an MAO inhibitor, I like to think of the presynaptic area, those little vesicles just full of uh, catecholamines, and when you give ephedrine, which indirectly causes it to release presynaptic catecholamines, as well as ephedrine has a postsynaptic effect, it may release a whole lot of those and have a massive hypertensive tachycardic effect. We can't predict exactly what it's going to do. Meperidine is another one we should avoid. Many possible drug interactions with MAOI inhibitors and there's a chance of serotonin syndrome. If someone's on an MAOI inhibitor, they're not breaking down serotonin uh, as much presynaptically and if they're on other drugs that raise serotonin levels, serotonin syndrome may result. Other psych medications, SSRIs like Prozac, used for depression, panic disorders, uh, OCD, PTSD. We usually continue those pre-op, but realize that some of these drugs, especially the older ones like Prozac, can inhib inhibit the P450 cytochrome oxidase system involved in the metabolism of many of our drugs. SSRIs in combination with other drugs like MAOIs, tricyclics, uh, opiates, Tramadol, dextromethorphan, which is in cough syrup, can result in an increased risk of serotonin sy syndrome, which we will cover in the next key word. Lithium is used to treat bipolar disorder. Preoperatively, patients can have problems with hypothyroidism, diabetes insipidus, some changes on the electrocardiography uh, that you obtain preoperatively, changes on their electrocardiogram, that is, and lithium can decrease MAC. It also potentiates both our non-depolarizing and depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. And these were keywords and the pharmacology keywords in the years past, that it decreases MAC and it potentiates both succinylcholine and our non-depolarizers like rocuronium. The next keyword is serotonin syndrome. 
And serotonin syndrome is a cluster of autonomic, motor, and mental status changes that result when you have excess 5-hydroxytryptamine or serotonin around. And the picture at the bottom is meant to represent this patient who is agitated, tachycardic, often hypertensive, uh, clonus and tremor and hyperreflexia present, and medriasis of their pupils, a classic serotonin uh, presentation. And agents such as MAY inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs, opiates, cough medicines like dextromethorphan, some antibiotics, and some of our other medications, uh, like our anti-nausea medications, can cause increased serotonin levels in the perioperative period and cause serotonin syndrome. So fentanyl, meperidine, and ondansetron would be some specific ones that we might be utilizing uh, that we should understand are affecting serotonin and may be, uh, when combined with other drugs, cause serotonin syndrome. What are some of the symptoms in management in serotonin syndrome? If it's mild and they have some pupil dilation, they're shivering and sweating, they're a little bit tachycardic, you can observe them, maybe even give them some benzodiazepines to calm them down a bit, and it usually will resolve. When it's moderate, they have altered mental status, they're agitated, disoriented, they have autonomic hyperreactivity, they may be rigid, tachycardic, rigid being the muscle rigidity, hyperthermic, and it can start to look like MH with uh, some other things that help us to realize that it's not MH. One of those is the cause, which is the drugs that raise serotonin levels, but it can look very much like it when you have a hyperthermic patient that is rigid. Cyproheptatine is a drug that can block serotonin's effects and may be used for these patients that have uh, serotonin syndrome. When it's life-threatening with delirium and hypertension and they're very hot, muscle rigidity, tachycardia, intensive care unit treatment with esmol or nitroprusside to control the hypertension and tachycardia, cooling measures, sedation, paralyzing the muscles, uh, ventilation may be needed, and mortality can ensue from serotonin syndrome. The next and last keyword is neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and the defect in this case is in dopaminergic receptors in the hypothalamus, and it is triggered by psychotropic drugs like Thorazine and Haldol that block dopamine receptors. It can also occur with drugs like MAOI inhibitors, uh, lithium, acute withdrawal of Parkinson's medications, but we normally associate it with psychotropic drugs like Thorazine and Haldol, and it is said to have slow onset MH-like symptoms. That is, they can have muscle rigidity, but the muscle rigidity is not because ranidine receptor defect and calcium and sarcoplasmic reticulum and at the muscle level, it's actually a centrally mediated effect. They often have mental status changes, temperature goes up, again looking like MH, acidosis, again looking like MH, tachycardia, even rhabdomyolysis can occur. And the management is discontinue the neuroleptic medications. Dantrolene, which is also uh, used to, uh, to treat MH, uh, can be used to treat neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Other uh, treatments for neuroleptic malignant syndrome, along with or besides dantrolene, include dopamine receptor agonists, remembering that the derangement is that the dopamine receptors are blocked and agonist like bromocryptine or amantadine occasionally can be used as part of the treatment for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So we covered more than a decade or so of keywords on psychiatric issues and anesthesia, focusing on electroconvulsive therapy, some of the drugs that are used uh, in uh, psychiatry like SSRIs and lithium, and some complications like serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And this is the end of this short vidcast, and I hope you make it a great day.